Mr. Martin, your kind introduction. My presentation for this afternoon is on the different management in including price productivity of dollar price in the Philippines and uh, nutrient management. As, uh, if you look at the nutrient management, it has been a subject of research for several decades. Starting from the 60s, 70s, uh, up to this time, up to present, uh, intensive and extensive research is being done along this line. So, the assumption at this point or at present is that results, uh, this is applicable to the Philippine condition or Philippine setting. Uh, results have been incorporated in nutrient management recommendations. And the second is uh, recommendations have been adopted or adopted by the farmers or it had been graduated uh, uh, down to the uh, users the, 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 the grassroots level and uh, rice nutrition the assumption here is that uh, or just like our hypothesis nutrition is that a yield limiting component in lowland rice production so current situation however if you look at our yields uh, we have low to medium productivity in our length, uh, length with lowland areas. Uh, uh, low to medium means it could range from uh, from two to uh, even uh, one to as high as seven, but the average of about 3.6 or 2.7 times per hectare. So uh, from this, uh, we have to, based on our assumptions that uh, these nutrient recommendations have been uh, translated down to the uh, users and the farmers our the next question is uh, why 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 is it uh, low uh, why 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 yields are low so uh, uh, the major uh, major question could be are there any gaps in the utilization of recommended or appropriate nutrient management and the second is uh, can nutrient management contribute to the improvement of lowland rice productivity Maybe this is one of our uh, the essential uh, questions that we have. That uh, uh, if we go down to the to the LGUs, it appears that they are uh, well versed in the nutrient management. Uh, uh, for example, if you tell them something, uh, they will assume that everything is uh, known to them or known. But uh, down to the farmers, I will see if that is true. So the presentation outline is. Uh, We'll cover nutrient balance and sources of nutrients uh, as a review. Then uh, we, uh, we have a glimpse of the chemical properties of the Philippine soils. Then we will look at the soil nutrient supply capacity and plant requirement. These are the technical basis for so that we could appreciate whether if we, look, uh, if we uh, should we think that uh, can we, if we can improve this really. Uh, the productivity of lowland rice via this nutrient management uh, uh, intervention. The fourth one is uh, uh, a side-by-side -side comparison between the recommended and actual nutrient management practices. And uh, in this portion, uh, we will determine the gaps, as, uh, which will be the basis for the nutrient uh, management approaches, our suggestions in improving lowland rice yields. So the last portion is uh, conclusion and recommendation. Okay, so uh, first with the nutrient balance, uh, consider the nutrient balance and sources of nutrients in the rice production systems. Of course, we have to talk about the inputs and the outputs. No? And uh, inputs basically are, uh, uh, these uh, in reds are, uh, The reds are the manure or fertilizer, crop uh, residues, irrigation sediments, dust, the biological uh, nitrogen fixation, uh, fixation products uh, from the seed. Also, we could uh, include uh, the capillary rice, the nutrients that, uh, that are coming by uh, capillary rice or diffusion from the lower, uh, lower, uh, lower layers of the, of the soil. On the other hand, uh, for those outputs, for the okay. 
for the the outputs in the system, in the production system, uh, we have the crop uptake, we have the gaseous process, and the leaching. Now, I try to, this is from the Doberman and Fernandes 2000, and I try to uh, uh, do some uh, computation based on those, and if we look at the percentage uh, contribution with the output and input, uh, for nitrogen, uh, for nitrogen, we can, uh, for nitrogen, uh, fertilizers and uh, biological nitrogen fixation uh, component have the, uh, uh, produce the uh, higher, higher, uh, contribute more to the input uh, for nitrogen. But for the crop uptake and uh, for the outputs, uh, crop uptake and gaseous losses are the major outputs in the in the production system. Hence, in general, if you look at uh, under uh, good crop management at the substantial yield level, uh, we have about a negative. If you look at the nutrient input output balance, there is a negative uh, values of 5 to 10 kilograms per hectare. Now, uh, if considering the phosphorus, uh, uh, most of the phosphorus uh, input are coming from fertilizers, uh, about 80%, uh, while 91 uh, for the outputs or the, uh, the, the loss uh, outputs or the losses from the systems come from the system, comes from the crop uptake, which is about 91%. So, but uh, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the nutrient input output balance still within the range as uh, still positive and within the range of what to think. Uh, one to ten. Now, for the potassium, the major input in the systems are the crop residues and the irrigation or uh, plus the sediments, uh, which uh, it is about uh, uh, 68 percent. Well, the major losses are due to crop uptake. So our range is uh, from minus uh, 46 to 8. So in some in some cases there is a positive uh, balance, but most of the time it's a negative balance. So this is uh, the the nutrient input output. We need a, uh, a a good crop management and a six-stand level uh, uh, production system. Now uh, I I also look at, uh, look at the the work of uh, Mura. Mura, Dr. Smura Valais and Pionis, 1995. You might be wondering, I consider this. This is uh, the most uh, intensive, uh, this is one of the most extensive data that we, we can have in uh, 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 Based on their studies on different soil series, we found out that uh, for the Philippines, uh, the range total end percent is within the range of average is uh, 0.17 plus or minus 0.11. So if you look at this point, minus 11, it's uh, really well, uh, some of our soils, maybe about if you assume that this is 0.17 is so the region, uh, the middle, uh, half are below that, no? because below the, uh, may, may, may fall within the low lower limit, because uh, I think uh, this 0.17 is still a medium, medium, uh, 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 major, uh, considered as a major fertility uh, and concentration, uh, concentration. But uh, if it falls with, uh, below 0.12, it becomes a uh, uh, point 0.12 is uh, to be considered as low. So now, in terms of uh, exchangeable potassium, uh, in, uh, we have an average of about 0.5 CMO plus per kg, plus or minus 0.4. Again, let's have a look at this uh, standard uh, deviation of 4, which means that if, for example, uh, the, uh, this belongs to a little bit high, 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 higher range, but if you look at this standard deviation of 0.4, it means a lot of our soils are below the concentration, uh, below the critical concentration. Uh, for the average uh, P205, or uh, we have about uh, four plus or minus four, so it means uh, 
some, uh, we cannot trace some, uh, we cannot uh, detect from the test, we cannot detect uh, phosphorus from our test. So, and also it could go as high as 4. So basically we have uh, limitations or we have uh, low concentrations of phosphorus in our soils. And uh, one of the, one thing that uh, about this concentration, I based the uh, high, medium or low based on our old, plan, uh, old, 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 old uh, values. But uh, the problem now is, the, the current problem now is the concentration that, uh, that are based on, were based on a lower yield at the time, or maybe about 20 or 30 years ago. Maybe this 0.17 under, yeah, I, I, uh, this 0.17 or even point, 0.5 or uh, 4 could even be, have a lower, lower, uh, uh, could be even uh, considered as within the lower, lower level of the range if uh, it could be calibrated within the higher level of uh, uh, higher, uh, higher level, uh, higher year range. Now, uh, one of the important, uh, I think, another one, another approach is aside from this analysis, we can also look at, or we can also look at the soil nutrient supply capacity based on emission plants. So this was done uh, here, uh, from 1990 to 2000 in uh, 179 farms across Southeast Asia and South and Southeast Asia. And the uh, Philippines is included there, Mekong Delta, is, uh, we have the Mekong Delta, we have the Philippines, Vietnam, Mekong Delta. Uh, for the Philippines, we, uh, the site is in Vivacilla. So these are on the rice defensively uh, the grown rice areas. So based on, based on the, based on the, uh, the findings, uh, the soil uh, supply capacity of soils without fertilizers could range, uh, for the nitrogen, could range from 70 to 80 uh, kilogram per hectare. For phosphorus, it could be 12 to 18, while potassium is 65 to 90. So basically, the conclusion from this, uh, conclusion from this uh, findings is that Lowland rice fields can sustain grain yields of two to three tons. This is an average uh, standard deviation still uh, without fertilizer application, assuming it is under uh, good crop management other than the nutrient management uh, component. Okay, so so based on uh, plant, uh, the next uh, parameter that we have to look at is the plant uh, NPK requirement. So the uh, Based on the, we, uh, the, the findings of uh, with, uh, uh, Dr. Christian Witten co workers in 1999, he found that uh, the efficiency, the internal efficiency, which is uh, means uh, kilogram grain per kilogram nutrient, is 68 for N, 385 for, uh, 385 for uh, phosphorus, and 69 for potassium. Now, if we are going to convert this on a per ton basis, uh, it will be equivalent and a ton, uh, a ton of uh, grain will require uh, 15 kilogram nitrogen, 2.6 uh, kilogram phosphorus, and 15 kilogram uh, potassium. Okay, so based on that, uh, is in is in is or soil uh, uh, so nutrient supply capacity, the big requirement of the rice yields, we can compute for the yields, uh, for the yields. So it means uh, if we consider the lowest uh, values, it is uh, the lowest values, the, for example, this uh, uh, 40, 12, 65, uh, we got, on the average, farms, farm, farms, um, can support at this uh, with this uh, 40, 40, 40 kilogram N in the in the soil uh, indigenous nutrient N in the soil could support at this 2.67, while indigenous P and phosphorus uh, and potassium can support 4.65 and 4.33. So uh, based on this, uh, nitrogen is the most healthy, while uh, uh, yields actually the range of yields that uh, 
the range of yields uh, that could, could be supported by indigenous uh, nutrient supply could be from 2.4, 2.8 to 4.9, to 4.9 tons per hectare, and that is from five Asian countries, including the Philippines. Now, uh, I will share one of uh, some of our data from our project in the CRDES. Uh, we have a range uh, with an average of 2.61 tons in an unfertilized uh, uh, fields. We have uh, an average of 2.61 tons per hectare, which range, uh, range from 1.59 to 3.42 tons per hectare during dry season. And we have 2.74 tons per hectare, which range from 132 to 4.59 tons during mid season in other case on condition. So this is uh, during dry season and with season. Now, the next is uh, this uh, information now is based on the in big fertilizer application and dry shields in 2008, which is uh, which we try to download uh, just a uh, 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 just a few day a uh, few 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 days ago. So this is past 2011, but uh, available is 2008 uh, uh, data. So in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, uh, in this data set. We have a total area planted, we have a total of area planted about 4.476 or 4.48 million hectares. But the area applied to fertilizer is about uh, uh, to 4.22 million hectares. So that is uh, if we, uh, by the way, uh, the, 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 this is uh, this 4.476 hectares is composed of. If we try to subdivide it again, uh, this is crop area, and fiscal area. If we try to subdivide it, uh, we have an irrigated area of about three three million hectares. We have about 1.3 million hectares of red fed, and approximately about uh, three to five uh, percent of the plant. Okay. But uh, in these earlier years, uh, it, it was reported that we have about 10% uh, 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 about 400 uh, hectares, 450,000 of uh, uh, 450,000 of upland rice, upland rice production. So that is 5.5 .5 on average. It means this is uh, the 5.5% uh, of our rice areas are unfertilized, no fertilizer application. And uh, if you look at the nutrient application uh, in PK, we have about 56.4 N, uh, 12, 12 uh, P205 and 8.3 P20. And we have an average of 3.68. So this is important because we'll use this later, uh, these values. Now, uh, we try to Recommend, uh, compare also the recommended and farmers nutrient management practices in terms of rate or dose. Okay, uh, recommended practices uh, during uh, the wheat season. I took this from the field rice uh, 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 production manual. Uh, during uh, the recommendation from that manual is about uh, is 115 uh, nitrogen, 27 phosphorus, and 57.5 kilogram potassium. Uh, for dry season, it's 150, about 150, 28, 58. And based on that, uh, I can sense that uh, even within the Palai uh, the Palai check, it appears that it is still a blanket, uh, blanket recommendation. Now, if you look at the farmers uh, for practices, uh, for the rates, we will use the data what that we talk about. Know? We have the 56 by 12 by 83. And still, we still we are look, still looking at we are still considering the 250,000 hectares which are not fertilized. So based on the rate alone, uh, whether it is the source could be inorganic or organic, we have a deficit of 56.8 by 15 by 49. So we are lacking in fertilizer application, uh, regardless of source. Uh, so that uh, 3.68 is really uh, 
that's uh, equivalent to amount that we are putting. Now, I look at the timing of application also. In our recommendations, current recommendations, we have uh, uh, five, four to five uh, uh, recommendations, the BASA, PESAL, uh, early tillering, uh, maximum tillering, okay, and monitorization, and sometimes an optional, uh, particularly during dry season, is the application of nitrogen during heating, heating or flowering. But for the farmer's practice, based on our uh, based on our experience and uh, based on our experience and data from the CRDES, uh, usually um, uh, farmers uh, apply uh, for those applying fertilizer fertilizers uh, apply uh, at least uh, uh, from one to twice uh, per season. So it could be usually it could be back basal or sometimes they apply this during the early delivery. And also, as usual, from the old uh, blanket recommendation, we apply, farmers are applying nitrogen during the panic organization. And sometimes farmers are also applying the soil applied fertilizers as a replacement for other, uh, they are applying foliar fertilizers as a replacement for the soil applied fertilizers. There are few farmers who are apply, uh, applying a, a full year during the late growth stages for those who can afford. So it means uh, because these full years are a lot, uh, uh, lesser, a, a, a lot cheaper. So uh, the remark, my observation from this is, of course, the frequency or timing of application is there is a wide gap of application. And uh, if you base on the yield component, Component based uh, analytical viewpoint, we often need to play the grain fail stage. By the way, uh, for those extension people, extensionists, or for those who are working at the, uh, at the farmers level, you can tell uh, farmers can uh, just tell you, uh, tell you that uh, for, uh, their yield uh, for this season is good because they have lesser, uh, lesser unfilled spikelets. Uh, most of the time, that's uh, what the uh, doctor said. I know if, if uh, the farmer will tell you that, uh, for example, you have a, I have a, I have a high uh, yield this season because uh, I have lesser um, or lower unfilled spikelets. That's that. So that is one the uh, most uh, or often uh, often neglected uh, portion in the nutrient management. Uh, another one is some are on the fertilizer source. The recommended are. Uh, actually, uh, our recommendations in, uh, are heavy on uh, inorganic. But uh, this organic and inorganic combinations actually was uh, pushed at uh, the balanced nutrition by the Department of uh, uh, BSWF was shelved for a time. So it, it, it is now being revived. Uh, the good thing is we are now uh, revisiting this uh, organic and inorganic combination. Also, we have the bioinoculants the use of bioinoculants, but uh, this was not yet a fully integrated in the recommendation systems uh, for rice. Uh, for the current farmers practice, of course, uh, farmers are generally, are still generally inorganic uh, based. Uh, some are starting to work on the or, or organic based uh, rice production. Uh, some are applying foliars as a replacement for the soil applied. Uh, Bioinoculants, uh, for the bioinoculants, still there are few users for this. And one of the one of the observations that we can have is uh, that we have is green manuring is not practiced at this point in time. Uh, uh, after uh, so much information generated in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, this is not being practice under field condition. So the remarks of uh, our note for this is uh, organic fertilizer, red manuring and foliar fertilizers are not in the current NM or nutrient management recommendation. And another one is the storage to recycling all included in the recommendation is not seriously being practiced by the farmers. Okay. For the nutrient management or in the integrated crop management tools or guides, uh, as of now, we have the Palai check, and Palai check it appears now, uh, I'm sorry, for, but my comment for this is, 
uh, it appears that it's still a top-down type. So it's just a repetition of, uh, it's just like a, uh, for the nutrient management, it is just an uh, elaborated uh, the blanket, uh, blanket uh, application of uh, the 90, the old uh, 90, uh, 60 to 90, 30, 30 for the wind season and the 120, 90 to 120, 45, 45 for the wind season. Okay? And uh, for the uh, nutrient manager, this nutrient manager is a, is a uh, decision support leader, the uh, tool. Uh, the integration of this uh, tool in the nutrient management is not yet fully, uh, has not, uh, yet, uh, fully uh, it's not yet, not yet fully integrated, but still, uh, we're still looking forward to this. Uh, for the current farmers, PC or Malaysia can have not strictly practice and reach critical or has not been reached, uh, has not reached the critical mass of farmers. So, the truth is that uh, with the farmers we have uh, worked uh, with uh, in uh, Tagalog, uh, Southern Tagalog, in Mindanao and others. Uh, they know the name, uh, the, the Palajit, or they know this uh, nutrient management manager, but they are not practicing it. Okay? So, my, the other comment from this is precision nutrient management to increase nutrient use efficiency is not in practice and we need that at this point. We need those. We need it at this point. So, this is the summary, so let's get this one. So suggested new trend management agronomic, uh, I, I put agronomic uh, approaches to increase food and rice yield. So we, the, the, one of the initial uh, suggestion here is uh, with the current, if our current application is 56 uh, uh, 12A, then we have to increase our fertilizer application at the farmer's level. Okay, the second is we have to improve the yield determining components during grain feeding. This is one of the weakest uh, portion of the nutrient nutrient management, which means we have to uh, uh, do a little uh, shifting of the timing of fertilizer application. And the third is we have to increase the nutrient uptake by a green manure. So we have to return the, the old practice of the green manure. Uh, we have to also look at the organic and organic combinations and the bio inoculant technologies to enhance PNF, the biological nutrient uh, fixation and the nutrient absorption facilitating microscopic organisms activity. The fourth one is use of slow release fertilizers to improve fertilizer recoveries. We have a lot of findings of this uh, people. If you just go to the library, you have a lot of work in the slow release uh, man, man coated is a uh, the osmo coat, the cheap ones, the deep coated, the cheap ones, the expensive ones, the expensive ones, we have, we have them. The print, print urea, the, 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 uh, the urea sulfur coated granules, technologies or the, the things that will improve the efficiency of these are already in the shelf. Okay? And the other one is the residue side recycling to increase nutrient input component of the production systems. Uh, one of, uh, I think uh, for those uh, traveling from north to south, every time just uh, look at the, the, uh, look at the, look down before you land during the harvest season, and most uh, there are a lot of uh, burning of straws along the valley fields, and that is up to now it's happening. And the last one is, of course, uh, we are not focusing on the nutrient management. We also have to look at the other component other than. Uh, that nutrient management. Other component, crop management components, just like the pest management, water management, those are as well as, as important as the nutrient management. Okay, In, uh, let's tackle that one by one and we have to do some computation. Proving to be able to increase fertilizer application, the assumption uh, in, this, uh, in this is that low and rice fields can support 2.5 tons per hectare yields without fertilizer application and the mean yields of 3.68 uh, tons can still be increased by uh, uh, one ton and the current NPK recoveries uh, if it recovery efficiencies are 40, 20, 35 uh, respectively, percent respectively. Now, uh, let's get back to the old, uh, uh, this is our 
uh, our formula, the needed fertilizer is we have to compute for the plant requirement minus the indigenous nutrient supply, both for East Indian cities and SC, uh, over fertilizer recovery efficiency. And if we are going to consider a 4.68 ton target here, uh, it is uh, we are at uh, one ton increase from the current main yield. We have this is our requirement plant nutrient requirement in kilogram per hectare, which is 70.2, 12.2, and 70.2 uh, 70 N, 12.2 P, and 70.2 uh, potassium. Now, uh, indigenous nutrient supply. We also use the uh, use the, the uh, base from the uh, base from the established uh, range, and we talk the lower the lower living. So, uh, uh, fields could uh, provide a uh, uh, during a cropping season. Uh, field a hectare field can provide at least 37.5 n. Uh, 10 phosphorus uh, uh, and 60 potassium. So if we divide this into, uh, uh, by the fertilizer recovery of 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and 35 per, uh, by, uh, percent uh, in PK respectively, we have about a recommendation of 81.8. This is just, a, not, uh, just an example because the indigenous nutrient supply portion is very important. We also have 11. Since this is a uh, pure uh, phosphorus, if you convert it into P205, then it's equivalent to 25. And for potassium, 29.1, uh, if you convert it into uh, P20, it is equivalent to 35. So it means uh, this is uh, the rate we can, for example, as an example, depending on the indigenous nutrient supply, so, uh, that can be uh, as a possible basis for increasing yield by one ton. Okay. Now, the second is uh, on the timing of uh, fertilizer application. If you look at this uh, year, uh, this uh, this uh, figure, uh, it is a uh, an absorption uh, under uh, low fertilizer end application, and the other one is under uh, higher fertilizer application. So basically. Uh, the initial is within the first month there is an exponential or exponential uh, absorption. After that there is a linear. Okay. So if from here we can see uh, uh, from this uh, figure, uh, it is very obvious that uh, if we apply more fertilizer, there uh, absorption there will be high absorption. Okay. So. Uh, now let's get back to the uh, let's uh, consider now the yield uh, yield components. Yield uh, components uh, is a function of number of panicles, number of spikelets per panicle versus spikelets and spikelet weight. Weight. So if you look at this, uh, the first two components are developed during the during the uh, early stage within the first uh, within the first uh, uh, 42 42 days. And uh, while the person field spikelets and spikelet weight are uh, developed during uh, within, uh, after flowering, so this means that if we apply more fertilizer, uh, regardless of the source, it means that we have a higher source of higher production of biomass. Okay, we have a higher production of biomass compared with this absorption uh, under lower nitrogen level. So. And in this, uh, with this, we are encouraging the development of tillers, which is reflected in the panicles and the number of spikelets per panicle at this stage. At this stage. Now, if it is high, uh, there is a higher absorption during the later stages, we are also encouraging the percentile spikelets, higher uh, percentile spikelets and drip weight. Now, uh, so the development of stages, by the way, if you look at it, is uh, 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 we have seen this uh, er earlier, no? That uh, during the vegetative, uh, during the vegetative, uh, the number of particles are developed by tillering. The spikelets of the particle is developed during the reproductive, 
and the person feel five spikelets and spikelet weight are developed during drain feeding. And definitely our interest this time because we know that uh, for the first three, uh, for the first two, we can develop that by higher pay, uh, early early application of fertilizer. But uh, for the green feeding, this is our concern. Uh, how to how to uh, this is more of a concern how to actually keep growth, uh, lower uh, medium to longer growth duration. Now uh, another another component uh, we have to look at another component. Uh, okay, if we look at this. Uh, this is uh, during dry season and during uh, wet season. So, this, uh, the number of spikelets or unfilled spikelets, if with varying varieties, uh, this is a study for three, we studied uh, this for about three years using about 100 uh, varieties and lines, including, including uh, traditionals. Uh, uh, mean that. Uh, there is a higher unfilled spikelets. Uh, high, uh, we can observe higher unfilled spikelets even during uh, dry season in longer duration, in medium to longer duration varieties. What we don't know is uh, the potential of the rice. For example, rice have the degenerated spikelets, and we cannot see that under ordinary, uh, under ordinary. Uh, uh, other ordinary experimental setup. So uh, actually, with increasing uh, growth duration, uh, we uh, the potential seed size is really very high. So we call it degenerated because we assume, and we can see that if uh, research on that are on the, uh, we can observe that at the base, in the nodal base. Now, during which so the the, the point here is. Uh, uh, the longer the duration, uh, the longer the duration, of, uh, duration, of, uh, duration of the variety, the, uh, the tendency is it has a higher yield potential. But under ordinary uh, fertilizer management, it, uh, we can observe a higher degree of unfilled spikelets. And I think the farmers here can attest to that. It usually, that's why. Um, if we consider, for example, an example is on uh, PSP RC18, uh, which is about 185. Uh, it is a high yielding, but the truth is it has more of it if we manage the timing of fertilizer. And um, that is consistent, but uh, and that is, uh, this observation is consistent under uh, wind season, but uh, most of the time, during wind season, the problem is even with the short duration varieties, uh, we have, which is uh, most of the varieties that we have now, cultivars that we have, is there is a problem with the unfilled spikelets. So I still, again, the the the, the unfilled spikelets is uh, remains to be uh, one of, should be one uh, remains to be one of the most important targets in increasing the yield uh, in lowland rice. So the explanation for that is, uh, for example, if you look at this. Uh, um, yeah. uh, if you look at this, uh, have a look at this. Uh, this is uh, these are the very early, early and medium. Medium is about 125. Uh, if you look at this, uh, this uh, point is the panicle initiation time. So it means. Uh, Medium duration, but I, uh, early duration varieties have their particle initiation during the, uh, with the nutrient absorption is still within the logarithmic phase, uh, within the exponential phase. Okay? This is the still the exponential phase. But the problem is with the, with the medium and long duration varieties, a uh, particle occurrence is, a uh, uh, particle uh, initiation occurs within the, with the nutrient managed uh, absorption is within the linear phase. So it means uh, the amount of energy that is taken by the part is also already low. So if this medium duration varieties or low duration have high biomass, they have produced higher seed uh, or can produce uh, higher seed containers, uh, higher yield containers, the problem now is the nutrient, the amount of nutrient that could uh, 
the source, uh, the nutrient source during the great feeding time. That's why our recommendation is again, we are going back to the yield component that uh, if we can modify or modify the time of uh, person film spike, film spike, wait, with these uh, medium to long duration varieties, then we might or we may. Actually, we have uh, data on this, we can increase the yield of these uh, long duration varieties. Okay? So, uh, now, the, the next, uh, the next uh, uh, approach for yield, uh, if it, uh, I, I made some, uh, some computations for this, for medium and long duration varieties, 125 days. Uh, variety with high potential sink size for yield containers, improvement of grid filling percentage via nutrient management. The approach there is the timing, uh, regardless of the source, it could be soil applied, it could be foliar or, or, or a slow release or organic matter approach. Uh, based on the uh, 3.68 tons yield per hectare, based on the 3.68 uh, tons uh, base yield, if we target Improvement by at, uh, by five percent, by at least five percent of during mid season, then we have a potential yield of uh, increment of at least point eighteen tons per hectare. Point eighteen is how many or uh, four four bags, huh? about four bags. But if we increase it during dry season, uh, uh, we can increase it, uh, increase the targeting. Uh, an increase of about 10% uh, in uh, percent field spike rates based on, based on 3.68 tons yield per hectare, we can have a yield of, uh, an increment yield of about 3.37 tons per hectare, about 7 to 8 tons per hectare. So, the th another one is, uh, we have to, I think uh, we must also look at the how to improve yield via increasing nutrient availability and enhancement of nutrient uptake. Now, we know there are so many reports just uh, about this green manure, and we have so many green manures that we have the uh, for the big things, I think we have the Digo Victoria as one of the uh, important class. And uh, GM crops, green manure crops, not uh, genetically modified people, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry for this. Contribution to nutrient availability could be about uh, from 20 to 30 kilogram per hectare. And if we target a 30% a contribution, means 30 of the lower uh, lower lower portion. This one, 30% of this lower portion, we can have at least uh, six to nine additional kg nitrogen per hectare. And if we convert that base uh, based on the 3.68 tons yield, it could be an added, uh, poten added potential yield of 0 0.4 to 0 0.6. Now, BNF, actually BNF as we have seen earlier, as is a very, uh, we are, uh, it's a, it is, uh, it is a, a major input in our production system. And BNF by an organic, organic integration, also the use of green manure, uh, or uh, green manures, uh, or uh, the, uh, the recycling of the residues, we have a contribution of about uh, 0.9 to 0.33. Based on this, uh, the range of 40 to 50 uh, is the reported value by the LADA, uh, Dr. LADA, so uh, Dr. Valls, Dr. Romanian, uh, from Ely. And uh, the, if we target about 10% of this, even the 10%, we can have at least uh, be expecting about Point na, uh, about 1 to 0.33 percent uh, potential increase in yield. For the bioinoculant, we have results for this. Based on our results, uh, it could uh, it increase yield by within the range of 6 to 8 tons per hectare. And, and we are, yeah, with, uh, with that, we, to, uh, we talk the lower, lower we, we, we talk the lower, uh, the lower value. And uh, the range is we could, uh, with the use of bioinoculant, we can have a potential yield increment of 0.22 to 0.29 based on 3.68 times yield. It might be question uh, the applicability of this if we need the uh, across. Of course, there are we have the standard deviations. Uh, these uh, these are just estimates, but uh, in some areas we might observe even higher than this. Okay. 
or in some areas we cannot observe this because uh, the uh, the application of these uh, of these uh, interventions are still, still uh, always site specific. Okay, so improvement uh, by using uh, uh, by improvement by increasing fertilizer recovery efficiency. As I mentioned earlier, we have the, uh, uh, so much uh, technology, indigenous technologies, and for uh, the the expensive technologies to to use this. Uh, currently, for nitrogen, we have about 40% nutrient efficiency. If our target is to increase it to 50, and this is attainable because uh, based on our uh, exper uh, experiments in the mid 80s to 90, uh, mid 80s to 90s. Uh, we can reach up to about 70% nutrient use efficiency based on that. Even the fertile areas, uh, the uh, USG granules, they have higher uh, use efficiencies. So, how about if we increase the yield by at least even 10% and increase this uh, efficiency to 10%? So, additional end, we can expect an additional end of about 5.64. If it is based, based on 10% increase in uh, fertilizer recovery efficiency, 5.64 kg N per hectare current application and uh, 15 kg N from, uh, based on uh, internal use efficiency, we can have a uh, potential yield increment of 0.38 or about 380 kg per hectare. So, uh, another one is just for, I think I compute for additional uh, uh, additional yield for this, but uh, just for the information, for our information, uh, nitrogen from in this rows is about uh, seven, uh, for per ton, per ton grain yield, we have about seven kilogram N from straw. Uh, sorry, uh, we have about uh, one uh, kilogram uh, phosphorus, Strong and about 14.5 kilogram uh, of potassium. So the essence here is that uh, if this, uh, if nitrogen, if straws are burned, we uh, we lost all of the head. If um, phosphor, uh, straw, if straw is burned, uh, we lost about 20 to 25 percent of straw uh, of, of P in the straw. And uh, if uh, for the potassium, even we burn it. Uh, we can uh, usually uh, potassium is not lost, but we just concentrated it on a certain portion of the field, you know, uh, and later it will be leached or just uh, be carried by the surface runoff. Now, if we summarize these uh, uh, nutrient management interventions, increasing fertilizer application alone, uh, could, uh, we can we can is uh, doable uh, is doable. We can increase uh, uh, one uh, from our 3.68. Of course, just imagine uh, the 3.68 is a uh, is a no, is an average. Uh, from zero to one or two to three, it's easier to increase the yield. Uh, but as we are working the higher yield levels, the efficiency is a little bit uh, decreased. So it follows the natural uh, Bell's curve. Or so we are using the mean. So we can increase uh, by about one improvement of grid feeding percentage 0.28. So uh, GM crops or uh, grain manure crops uh, about 0.5 BNF by BNF about 0.21 per ton per hectare. Uh, storage fertilizers 0.38. And if we total, it could be uh, 0.22 tons or 2.63 tons. But uh, I, 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 I don't want you to have a uh, 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 the under field condition, we cannot do all of this. Either one or two combinations could be done, but at this point, the most doable one is if considering minus the social economic or social, uh, social the financial financial uh, considerations, uh, that addition is the most important uh, addition of fer uh, fertilizer application. Again, I'm repeating, regardless of the source is still the most doable or the most feasible one. So, uh, if you total that, the uh, base yield plus the interventions, we can have uh, about 6.35. But this time, you, have, uh, you might ask again, I, I would like to answer that. Uh, that the uh, yield limiting, according to government firmers, 
their summary is that the, uh, based on the based on, on the on the on the data uh, the data that uh, that was generated for several years uh, the, uh, nutrition or uh, nutrition crop nutrition could contribute if if, if done badly could contribute to as low as high as 20 percent yield yield reduction for the crop management it's the same uh, about 20 percent so if we combine that it could uh, total to 40 percent now if we are going to uh, solve this li yield limiting components by a nutrition with a base yield of 3.68 we can have at least 4.91 so our own original assumption is still uh, working if, if we check it is still working now if uh, the crop, there is a problem with the crop nutrition, but the crop money, uh, uh, no problem with the nutrition, but the crop management is a problem, then with, uh, the yield reduction will be by 20% and still the same. We can still work on it. But many people, these uh, yield reductions and the field conditions are not extremes. Those are, uh, th th there might be, uh, it could be 10, 15, very, very, uh, 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 it is a very, very, uh, 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 a very, very uh, highly uh, variable under field condition. Okay? So, for the conclusions and recommendations, uh, increasing productivity of lowland rice is possible uh, from 3.68 to 4.68 by just increasing the fertilizer application. Uh, 3.68 to as high as 6.31. 6.31 that means that we have to include all the all the uh, doable components by improving uh, uh, different management components plus the fertilizer application. And if the assumption here is we are under both crop management other than the nutrition for sure. Uh, the second is uh, one of the, I think uh, it's time for us to shift from this uh, uh, this uh, calendar type or blanket type of recommendation uh, we have to move to the integra uh, integration of the decision uh, needed uh, tool in nutrient management, the site specific. I think uh, the most advanced for us, uh, we have a lot of, uh, we, have a lot of uh, we have some tools, but uh, the one applicable to the, uh, to the, uh, to the Asian, to the uh, Asian level, including the Philippines, is the nutrient manager. Uh, and the third one is we have to review the nutrient management technology recommendations, the delivery systems, the, okay, recommendations means we have to revert back, uh, we have to consider now the organic and organic uh, uh, combinations, we have to consider the green manures which were uh, lost, uh, we can remember the 1960s, we can still see some long bits in the fields, eh? but as this time, even during the follow period, is one. so recommendations should uh, consider that, nutrient recommendations. Um, the delivery systems, which is a big plan for us, the extension portion. Uh, uh, we have the recommendations, but uh, can we assure the delivery system could reach the farmers? And the last one is the support services. The um, question is, uh, the, the most question, uh, uh, the question of this time is to take our farmer's capability. So if we know that uh, we can increase yield by this, uh, can the farmer afford to buy by like this? So these support services may include uh, from the protect the, uh, the the price control of the, the, the subsidy or uh, I'll just give you an example why uh, why Japanese farmers are have a very high uh, how, uh, uh, Japanese uh, rice production is a dying dying uh, if they were because the government is subsidizing the price of their product. Uh, for us, it's a double edge. Uh, uh, aside from no no subsidy or uh, I don't know that other term, no subsidy from the uh, pricing subsidy or right pricing, even the farmers are paying the other taxes for the inputs they are applying. So double but the tax. That's the the point. How how how, the, how can we implement a good crop management if? The delivery systems and related services, uh, sort of, uh, services are the, uh, the, the weaker things. But by the way, I forgot we have the 
in the crop production system, pest management, water management to give about, are, are also very important. And we assume that we are under nutrient, uh, good uh, crop management. Kasi, because uh, pest management, uh, if uh, uh, the pest uh, infestation, it could even wipe out, uh, to wipe out the whole uh, crops, uh, the stunning crops. So, uh, that's how we have. Uh, we, so we have to look at it in a... Uh, 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 okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Santa Cruz. Uh, if you want to look or take a closer look at Dr. Santa Cruz's presentation, you may download his PowerPoint presentation, which will be made available at the APSS web page in the CIRCA website later next week. So at this point, I would like to invite the audience to use the microphones around the room for your questions or comments regarding Dr. Santa Cruz's presentation. Please uh, use the microphones. Yes, Dr. Rebecca. Thank you for the nice presentation. Okay, I have, I have a question. I do not know new trade money. And then, how, what seems to be wrong with it? Because uh, you said that you need to review the regulation of the NM. What seems to be wrong with not, it? Uh, yeah, I think mean, uh, NM is not uh, nutrient management. I'm sorry, I sometimes. The review is on the nutrient management technology, not nutrient manager. Yeah, nutrient manager. By the way, nutrient manager is, uh, uh, I just would like to get back to this presentation. Nutrient manager, manager is based on this uh, uh, working uh, okay. This is the essence of nutrient manager. Uh, fertilizer applied is based on plant requirement here. Uh, you have to consider also the indigenous nutrient supply based on, uh, you have to consider the recovery efficiency. This is the heart of the nutrient manager. Southern are still uh, thinking about the questions. I would like to part of this song. Uh, Moi is uh, one uh, tool in uh, identifying deficiencies in soil or uh, toxicities. Is that uh, a good uh, base to work on in relation to trying to find out what uh, fertilizer recommendation there would be? Uh, I also this time based on my personal opinion. Moet is, uh, I think, uh, Moet has no capacity to predict the amount of info that should be applied. You can just, uh, we know that uh, in PKR, we know that uh, in internal use efficiency of the uh, for the NPK, that the importance of Moet is when there are, uh, when nutrient deficiencies other than NPK are present in the area. I think uh, certificate is a uh, uh, I, uh, actually, I, suge I suggested to, to I suggested the, to some uh, people to, to that uh, to that soil, some soil scientists that, that they were improving the soil skin because uh, from soil skin they can drive away to get the amount that we put, but it must be calibrated with uh, appropriate yield levels. For example. Um, for the soil testing uh, earlier, maybe uh, the maximum year that time is about 5,100 uh, 5, cabanas. So this time we have to, if you want uh, to have uh, a more response. That's why, uh, that's the thing that, uh, for example, farmers, just uh, look at the farmers, uh, that the progress of farmers who are yielding 150, uh, 200 meters, but they are applying more than what is uh, uh, recommended by the certificate or given by the uh, laboratory uh, uh, laboratory uh, recommendations. Okay. Just example for those uh, uh, example for those uh, who are planting hybrids. Uh, at least the good thing about I, I'm not uh, told this I, I, the good the good thing about this hybrid is they consider the right nutrient punch because of course of to buy it then you have to put all the things proper Any more questions from our audience? Yes, sir. Good afternoon. 
That's why uh, the full years as a, as an added as an added uh, fertilizer during the post uh, uh, pre or post flowering stages is that uh, for the soil people there is such thing as the, the rate of supply capacity of the soil. If the if the demand is too enough, uh, is too great, uh, is too large. At a, at a point, but it cannot be sustained by the amount of release from the soil, then that's where this nutrient comes. And those are, those are, the, the micronutrient, uh, it's not a deficiency, but the, the need for micronutrient are, if we are operating within the level of about six, seven, eight tons, 
That's why uh, usually for those shielding about eight times, nine, seven, seven, eight, nine times, they use foliars with the minor entrance, aside from the MBA in that. Any more questions from our audience? Yes, sir.
helps in the race of Bosporus uh, <coughs> then. Of course, Dashun is not really that problem because essentially Philippines is a gift of volcanoes, so we have a lot of potassium in our soils. Uh, <coughs> so again, going back to that point, I see your presentation is a good one that well, we can produce for the rice. But on the other hand, if you look at the resources, if you look at climate change now, by the way, the, rate, the trend on, on the El Nino occurrence, uh, if you look at the trends in El Nino occurrence, it is occurring for every 15 years. So next year is the big tint of the cycle. Hopefully, we will not have uh, uh, disastrous El Nino again next year. So all these things, all nutrient management, etc., all these varieties will all always depend on the water. But of course, crop production is essentially carbon dioxide plus water and all these things. So anyway, uh, thank you also Pompe for putting this together. But uh, what my message, final message to the audience that hey, we should help each other. <laughs>